Hey everyone, it is May 7, 2014. I'm Renee Ritchie, and this is the show where we talk all about the iPhone, the iPad, the Mac, and everything Apple. Today, that includes Katie Cotton, it includes some stuff about the App Store and games, and it includes Google's new foray into apps. This is the iMore Show. Joining me as always, the kaiju of love, straight from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, it's Peter Cohen. How are you, Peter? I am well. How are you? I'm doing very well, fans. I was going to say I'm doing very well, thank you, but fancy shades, Peter. Oh, thank you. Yes, my gunners. Um, I, I wore these at uh, um, at uh, Macworld Expo back in March, and I'm giving them another try in the office. Nice. I just assumed that those were to hold your mutant uh, Cyclops vision in. Well, you know, if you've ever used... Um, uh, flux um, on your computer monitor, you know the app that uh, yep. that changes your um, uh, the the gamma of your monitor based on what time of day it is. Yes. it's sort of like having flux built into your face. Hmm. <laughs> also joining us, the how to editor and chief ninja at iMore, Ali Kazmuha. How are you, Ali? I'm good. It's finally spring. Maybe yeah, you said it's like you. 80 degrees in Hoosierville or something. Close. Yeah. Nice. All right. So are you defrosting? Yes. All right. So I'm going to get, I'm going to dive right into this. Peter, I was, I think shocked is a f fair word to see the news today that Katie Cotton, Vice President of Public Relations at Apple, longtime firewall between Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, Apple, and the media is retiring. Yes, indeed. You know, I, for anybody who's ever worked as a tech journalist uh, uh, in the Apple uh, ecosystem, Katie Cotton's name is to be feared and respected and and uh, and liked alternately, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, um, uh, you know, Katie was certainly a dominant presence, a dominant, although silent presence uh, at Apple. You know, you never saw anything attributed to, uh, to, to Katie in any press release or, uh, for that matter, in much of anything that anybody's ever written about Apple, but uh, in, absolutely instrumental in uh, uh, being the uh, the way that Apple communicates with the outside world and sort of ruling that that uh, that empire. So it'll be interesting to see where Apple goes from here, whether they promote from within um, uh, uh, or bring somebody from the outside to replace her. There is no truth to the rumor that Jim Dalrymple is going to replace her and make Heineken the official Apple beer. It, it ultimately did turn out to be a, uh, a dispute with Heineken quantities. Uh, apparently, Heineken is, is actually unable to um, uh, provide, at least in, in the, the area where he'd have to live in California because of environmental laws, a, uh, an Olympic swimming pool filled with Heineken. Uh, but there are ways around it if there's real motiv motivation, I think. Yeah, it's really interesting because, as you said, Katie Cotton was a force of nature, but she was very much behind closed doors. You most typically see Steve Dowling um, giving quotes if it was for uh, an Apple corporate ma matter or one of the heads of iPhone or iPad PR um, or, or one of the respective divisions, depending on what the exact quote was about. But she was always there. If you ever saw Steve Jobs or Tim Cook or any high-ranking Apple official at a, sorry, executive at a press event, she was absolutely there between them and the media. But she's also trained uh, you know, and, and put together an incredibly good, savvy, smart team at Apple. And I don't know, because we've seen a lot of, like, we see, we saw um, Bob Mansfield, former head of hardware engineering, uh, move into special projects and sort of retire and hand things over to Riccio. And we've seen, sorry, Riccio, and then we've seen um, more recently Peter Oppenheimer sort of retire, and, and or he's in the process of retiring and um, handing things over to uh, Luke. I'm going to get his last name wrong, Peter. What's his last name? Uh, Maestri. Master, yeah, that's right. So it, it is almost like a changing of the guard in many ways at Apple these days. Uh, yeah, it, it, and change is bound to happen, you know, because people age out, people um, get other interests, people whatever. Uh, Apple has done an incredible job of retaining its top executive talent and not letting anybody else poach them. They take very good care of them, you know, and plus it's an opportunity to work for Apple. You're an apex predator. Uh, kind of makes, uh, you know, going somewhere else kind of difficult. Uh, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens from here. I don't know if... Uh, um, if 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 much of anything will change, because uh, uh, it seems like Apple has a very continuous sort of 
uh, PR presence that's made of, of people who uh, all are sort of, you know, career uh, Apple employees like that. As you mentioned, Steve Dowling, for example. Um, and there are others within the organization that, that, that are similar. It's, it, there's a remarkable amount of stability when you get to the senior um, level in that company. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And Ali, I don't know if you have anything you want to share on this, but it comes the same week that, or the week after Angela Ahrens, who's um, the first female senior vice president at Apple. Um, it, there's a lot of new blood moving in there, but it seems like Apple is good at culturally, well, you know, John Browlett aside, culturally indoctrinating them into the company. Yeah, I would agree. I don't know too much about Apple PR, um, but like you or Peter said, anyone knew who Katie Cotton was, and I don't, I don't know. I don't really have too much of an opinion, but I think that there's enough culture there that it's it's not really going to matter who's at the helm. I think you have so many people that are cultivated inside of Apple that it's it's a change, but it's not really, if that makes sense. No, I think it does, and I think, Peter, we've talked about this before, a lot of these people literally survived the Steve Jobs era, the launch of the <laughs> iPhone, the launch of the iPad. They worked untold hours a day, every day of the week for years, and yes, they were very well compensated, but a lot of them, I think, have come to the point now where the iPhone 5 and 5S are mature products. The iPad Air, iPad Mini Retina are mature products. And they just, they're exhausted and they have a ton of money and they just want some time to enjoy their families and breathe a little bit. Wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. You know, and, and hopefully they, uh, uh, they're they able to do that. But there's always an excruciating amount of work to be done at Apple, you know, because they're always on the constant, you know, they're on the edge of innovation all the time. Um, and they, they always bat for the fences. So that's... That's got to be a grueling uh, experience for anybody to deal with uh, on a regular basis. So it, it definitely uh, sort of underscores, uh, <laughs> you know, what sort of fortitude these people have to have to do this work. Yeah, and I think there's a good blood. I think it's good to have new blood. I think it's good to have fresh perspectives. I think, especially when it's combined with the experience of a Tim Cook or a Phil Schiller, or you know, the people who've been there and now running the, you know, Craig Federici and are running those divisions now. Absolutely, you know, and I guess I, I don't I don't expect to see too much change either. I'm much in Ali's camp about uh, expecting sort of a steady state from Apple from here on out. Well, so we've got Angela Ahrens now. She has been ensconced at Apple. She's officially mm -hmm. started. She's had her Tim Cook lunch. Ali, are you expecting anything different at Apple Retail? Do you think she's there to sort of shore them up, or is she there to take them in a bold new direction? Um... I don't know. I, I see the changes that Burberry kind of went through over the past couple of years and under her direction, and she kind of shook things up and opened lots more retail stores and outlet stores, and I had some friends that worked for that company, and it, it seemed like retail policy changed, and it, it was for the better in that case. So I think we'll see some changes. I'm just not really sure what they'll be on more, Apple. More tartan? Yeah, maybe. She's, Peter, she looks to be, have been really good and really effective at getting Burberry into the Asian market, which is obviously key for Apple. Yeah, that's a very good uh, observation, Renee. Uh, clearly, the Asian market is incredibly important to Apple. You just have to look at their bottom line um, to, to understand that. So um, having an executive that gets it uh, is important. It'll be interesting to see what Aaron's brings to you know the, the culture at Apple. Um, that, you know, the, the, the segment of Apple that Aaron's is running has really kind of been, it has not been rudderless, but it hasn't had a personality associated with it since Ron Johnson uh, left Apple, you know, a positive uh, personality association anyway. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what she brings to the mix and, and how much uh, uh, of that she's allowed to articulate by herself you know, without making it an Apple corporate presence. Um, as far as the Asian market is concerned, though, it'll be really interesting to see what that means exactly. Does that mean expanding Apple's appeal to the, you know, huge and burgeoning middle class in China? Does that mean going to, you know, other countries uh, in the area and, 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 and taking uh, uh, a different approach? What do you think? 
Um, yeah, no, I think just getting the stores in there. I mean, we've seen Apple's profits in those areas. I mean, they were up in the BRIC countries, but they were also up um, in Japan. They're doing very well. China is a tough market. They've got a few stores there. It, they've been really, I mean, between software features, services, and retail, they've been really pushing that. And I think Ben Thompson said it well when he said that being head of Apple retail is the closest thing there is to being like a president level executive at Apple because you have so many thousands of people. It's almost a company within a company might be a fair way of saying it. And being rudderless for that long, even with you know Tim Cook's, um, uh, uh, at least they're credited to Tim Cook's policies on trying to boost iPhone sales at Apple stores and the upgrade policies, the recycling policies, all those kinds of things. I think it's good to have someone with that vision, that foresight. And that personality, and my only question, Ali, is do you think she'll be allowed to show that? I mean, she has a Twitter account. She was obviously spoke publicly when she was at Burberry. That's not usually what happens with Apple executives, but I think given her character, it'd be good for Apple to put to sort of let her be a little social. I think it would be good too, but I don't know if I see that happening. Hmm. Not on the Apple front. I, I don't know about socially in public. I think we're going to see some changes with retail stores and maybe some policy. I think it's interesting some of the stuff that they're doing with repairs now and you know some of the some of the changes they've made to what they're doing in store. So it'll be interesting to me to see if that changes again. Yeah, apparently they're going to email everybody who doesn't have a 5S yet and invite him in to upgrade. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that if you, if you can hold off, if you want an iPhone 6 and you can hold off for an iPhone 6, which will theoretically be announced sometime in September, you should. But if you don't care about the latest and the greatest and you get a really good deal, you know, maybe, you think it's worth exploring, Peter, or is that just a, no, a non-starter? I think that uh, uh, the the iPhone 5s is a fantastic phone for a lot of people who don't have them already. You know, people who have uh, 4s's or even 4s or maybe even older iPhones. You know, there's still some of those folks out there. Uh, and if you don't want to get into a situation where you're paying a lot for a phone, I think that it's a, it's a great idea uh, to do. I have I have very few complaints about my iPhone 5s. The, the complaints that I have about my iPhone 5s have virtually nothing to do with the hardware and everything to do with you know just quibbles about the way that iOS works. Yeah. Uh, but the hardware itself is is pretty awesome. All right, so we've got a couple of questions already, and I'll I'll farm them out. Um, with iPhone 6 rumors to release, of, this is from uh, Nilesh, uh, by the way. With iPhone 6 rumors to re rumor to release a seven, oh, sorry 4.7 inch phone. How does one-handed use? Uh, how does that affect one-handed use, and especially the top bar? Because iOS has been a very top bar, navigation bar centric operating system. I don't know about you, Ali, but I think uh, Apple can and already is shifting a lot of that to software. I mean, we've seen BlackBerry handle that to some degree already. iOS 7 has the persistent back gesture, um, the forward gesture in some apps. I, I can see a lot of that being handled just by really smart software. Yeah, um, I think it's a it'll be a combination of how Apple handles the hardware and how they handle the software. Um, I in 4.7 inches, if that's what's rumored, it's really not that it's not that big of a difference. A good phone to compare is I was uh, in a Radio Shack and I looked at my phone compared to a Moto X. I believe that's a 4.7 inch phone, and the difference is not really that big. Um, I've had some hands-on time with the Galaxy S5 and an M8 lately, and those are a little too big for me, and I can't see Apple going that large. Um, HTC did a little bit better of a job, in my opinion, with handling one-handed use, because uh, some of those phones have, you know, you can set it up to where the screen is actually smaller. It's like a picture inside of the screen for one-handed use, which I think is weird, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> Samsung, the capacitate of the touch buttons on the bottom of the screen, I constantly accidentally hit those when I go to reach the upper corners of the screens using it one-handed. So I think it's all about how you manage to do that. HTC moved the buttons on the screen, which to me was smarter because they're there and you don't hit them on accident. I mean, it, they just come on the Samsung so close to the bezel of the phone, you it, it senses any little touch and you'll just basically, I'll go to tap something and I'll be out of the next menu because I hit the back button. I think the other important thing, um, Peter, is the physical, because there, I have a Nexus 5 and I have a Nokia Lumia 1020 and they're both 
very similar screen size, roughly five inch screen size. The Nokia just feels so much bigger and heavier. And I, even though my brain tells me the same screen size, the Nexus feels easier to use. And I think that's part of what Apple will work out. There's rumors already that it'll be an almost iPod touch-like design. And I think within the screen size, it's still important to nail down the hardware surrounding that screen. Uh, yeah, of course it is. That's the difference between Apple and everyone else. So we'll see what happens. Um, one thing I know is that whatever Apple comes out with, it's going to feel uh, uh, effortless to hold because that's that's the way that, that, that they've, they've always been. Uh, so I'm not worried about that. But, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, um, that's the key difference between, you know, what you see from Apple and what you see from others. Yeah, and the one thing, I mean, last year already, when iOS 7 was introduced, there were rumors about rounding off the edges of the screen because unlike the iPod Touch, unlike the iPad, the iPhone is a, is square. I mean, it's a rounded rectangle extruded, extruded upwards, and that's okay, but I like the rounded feel of the iPod Touch, and I think especially if we start getting heavily into gestures, rounding the corners, and this is not like a little birdie told me, I just think in terms of ease of use, that kind of thing becomes important, and when you have bigger phones, there's so many other little decisions you can make, it's not just, what I'm getting at is it's not just screen size, that's the usability deciding factor, because you can have, hor people have made horrible small sized phones for years. <laughs> well, rounding the corners has an important ergonomic benefit, it m enables you to uh, you know, reach that much more of the uh, the area of the st the screen with your thumb. You know, and it, it, a lot of people love to use their devices one-handed. You know, it, it's very convenient to just flip it open and uh, you know, or, or flip it out of your pocket and and type a quick message or you know, access an app or make a call or whatever. Routing off the corners has that effect. You know, you've got more more area, more surface area on the screen that you can reach just holding it in one hand. And so, the iPhone 3G and 3GS were marvelously ergonomic to little devices. I remember when the 4 came out, the thing that irritated me the most is with the 3G, 3GS, when I pulled my phone out of my pocket, I always knew before I even looked at it what orientation and direction my phone was in. Since the 4, 4S, 5, and 5S are flat slabs, you don't really know. I mean, I've pulled it out thinking that, you know, I was had the front of my screen facing up and it was actually the back of the phone because they're both flat. That's very true. Yeah, you know, you find you you tend to find that divot that the that's where the home button is at the Touch ID sensor, and uh, uh, orient yourself that way. And it's a lot easier when you've got a curved back that you know you can feel against. I do miss uh, the curved back of um, the old iPhones. Yeah, here's no. the 3GS and the iPhone 5C. Actually, I mean, if you're not if you don't really care about the high end metal, I've always a lot of geeks said that the five if the 5C had the same internals as the 5S, they might have gone that way instead because it feels so nice. You have yeah, to say I something, Ali. You can't, we can't, sorry, you'll just say it, hold it up and say something. I think that you can do curved edges wrong though. Like I really want to like the HTC One, the new one, but the combination of the material they used and how they sloped the back makes it really hard to hold on to. So even though it's not flat, it's I still find even though the iPhone 5S has a flat back, it's still easier for me to hold on to. So I think that it depends on the material too that they choose to use. Like this plastic is kind of matte, it's not real slippery, so it, it, you can grip it. So I think that's important too. I think I think we're getting kind of down the rabbit hole, though. I mean, you know, how many people put ca cases on their phones for exactly this reason, you know, to help grab it out of their pocket better, or to help know, uh, you know, maybe without even realizing it, maybe people who are just, you know, making these decisions purely on aesthetics, but you still get to know that shape in your pocket real well, and it changes. So I, I don't know how down we can really get on Apple for, you know, the slap design, even though I'm not partial to it. But it's just because I've I've almost always got my iPhone in a case. But look at how pretty this is, Peter. So thin, so pretty. I have to get a kaiju one for my for, <laughs> for Godzilla next week. I mean, Godzilla's Godzilla should be a bank holiday in the U.S. I've decided. <laughs> Nice. Uh, one more question before we move on, and I'm going to throw this to Peter because I know that he's going to say there is no limit at this, you know, with his music collection. But um, when will we finally see Apple start at 32 gigabytes and go up to 128 gigabytes on the iPhone? They already have 128 gigabytes on the iPad. Typically, for the last, at least in, for history to date, Apple has used the S models to increase the storage. They did not do that with the 5S. I have such conflicted feelings about this because there's a cloud now 
Uh, but there's also double density NAND. But, but I don't know, Peter. Do you do you need that much storage on your iPhone? The only reason I subscribe to iTunes Match is because I can't carry my entire music library around with me. Now, I, I have no idea whether or not I'm representative of any kind of population. I know that I would certainly be less inconvenienced if Apple were to release um, a much larger iPhone than they have already. A one terabyte iPhone. I would love a one terabyte iPhone. I might even consider paying for a one terabyte iPhone if it weren't astronomical. You know? I would love I would love to have that kind of storage. I realize that we're years away from it. But the fact of the matter is the needle hasn't moved on iPhone um, sizes in a while. Since the 4S. Yeah, since the 4S. You know, the maximum that you can get is a 64 gigabyte phone. You know? Now, that's a lot more than I even have now. 32 is what I use. But... Um, th- it it makes it makes life more convenient to be able to access more stuff um, that's local to your device. So I would love to see it. I think a lot of it depends on the evolving use of the phone too. You know, apps continue to get get larger and larger, and their data sets get larger and larger with them. Um, and it, it, people can continue to collect more and more digital data on their phones. Uh, people don't carry photo albums anymore. They keep thousands and thousands of pictures on their phones. This is our trip to Majorca. This is, you know, my kid's graduation. This is uh, our wedding, whatever it might be. People keep their entire lives on these devices. You know, and the consumers are, are driving the demand for it. The fact that we hasn't, haven't seen it yet kind of suggests where the balance is uh, in the way that Apple sells these things. But Apple's pricing uh, for, uh, for memory is just so arbitrary and weird. I don't think it's arbitrary and weird. So this is this is my understanding of Apple's memory price. I, I know, it, sorry, it is arbitrary and weird, but it's for a reason. So Apple needs to have a low end, middle end, and high end iPhone. That's just the way that marketing works. Everyone comes in for the low end. People who you know have more money than time always buy the high end, and most people end up buying the middle of the road, which is a 32 gigabytes. But there's sorry in this case, but there's very little Apple can do to differentiate the phones. Like what makes a low end, middle end, and high end iPhone within one line, like iPhone 5s. Um, so you know they can't remove features because that would be silly. There's very little they can do. They can't have like uh, the the one end has a sapphire glass screen, the other one doesn't. Or at least they haven't done that yet. But it's very easy for people to understand. It's something palatable to people um, who don't know much about RAM, but just think in general that oh, I'm paying this much, I get a small, medium, or large storage capacity. So it's it's. It makes absolutely no sense, but you know, to, to people who are trained in the industry, but to what Peter people, Peter calls muggles or what you know some people call civilians, it's just a very easy way for Apple to differentiate the products within the line. I don't know if I explained that well. Well, they did it kind of once with the iPhone 3G. The white model was only available if you bought a 16 gig, wasn't it? Yeah, and I think you know people would say, well, why do I pay? They did that with the black, the black MacBook too, right, Peter? Like that it was, was hundred bucks. It was a status more. symbol, I think. You know, oh, I have the more expensive iPhone. But people probably get people. just as mad for the colors they would. For, I mean, it's just as yeah. arbitrary as a storage capacity. Mm-hmm. You know, but you can get a 128 gigabyte iPad Air. You can get a 128 gigabyte um, iPad uh, Mini with Retina display. You can't get a 128 uh, gigabyte iPhone, even if you want to. Um, and I don't think that engineering's got everything to do with it. I, th- I think no. that you know they can make memory chips that are small enough and uh, consume little enough juice, you know, c- compared to what they're using now. It's not a question of of scaling the technology up. They just don't want to offer it. Well, Wench in the chat room is saying that you could make the sizes basic, make it based on size. The cheap one is four inches. The mid-priced one is four point seven, and the lar- and the expensive one is five point five inches. I'm sorry, Ali. What did you just say? I, well, I think it's the same chips in both. It's just you'd have m- more sets. Right. Exactly. So I'm not fitting anything. I almost think it's how Apple wants people to perceive them. They want the iPad for media consumption. At least at this point, I feel like you know, I've gotten to the point at least with my devices where. I purposely don't put video and media on my iPhone because my iPad has way more storage space. So I could probably never go without having an iPad now because I have 80 gigs worth of stuff on it. And I won't ever be able to fit that on my iPhone, so I'm going to have to continue buying iPads. Don't you stream, Ellie? 
Huh? Don't you stream a lot? I stream music, but movies I buy from iTunes, and I always have downloaded on my iPad. I don't know. Maybe I'm just excessively anti-iTunes match today because of my recent editorial. <laughs> Yeah, uh, um, so before we get it, does that make any sense? Because the iPads now, the Air and the Mini are differentiated not only by capacity, the you know, $100 increment capacities, but also by screen size. I know Peter's gone on record as saying he'd love next generation iPhones to be identical, but yes. for screen size. So, Ali, could you, would, would you like a world where 4 inch, 4.7 inch, 5.5 inch is how Apple differentiated the iPhone line? No. Um, I can just, I, I think personally that that would drive up manufacturing costs. It would also create a lot of issue with demand. I think there's a reason Apple does things the way that they do with manufacturing, and it has everything to do with being able to crank out a quality product in a certain time frame and meeting demand. And I think if you have three separate phones with three different screen sizes, now you have three completely different manufacturing processes. I think that would make it more expensive for a consumer. I think we're getting there, though. I mean, we've got two now. We've got the iPhone 5S and the iPhone 5C, both on separate manufacturing processes in the same year. Yeah, but the iPhone 5C manufacturing process is pretty much the 5, minus the casing. So it kind of seems like that. And it, it's almost like that replaces, like, the when the iPhone 4S came out. The 4 was still manufactured, but in a, a smaller capacity. So it's kind of like they really did just replace if that makes sense, because the iPhone 5 doesn't exist anymore. It would be the same as them having a 5 and selling it for cheaper. They just changed the case back. So it, it to me, it kind of seems the same. They already have so, mi so much of that going. They already have a bottom, mid, and high-tiered. Whatever the newest model is has been the, the high-tiered iPhone. Storage capacity, like Peter said, is just weird. So many possibilities. The iPhone 4 is no longer being sold in India, though. Sad. Well, the 4S is going to replace it, right? Yeah, although it's still being sold in Brazil, Brazil, Indonesia, and China, I think. That little sucker is holding on for dear life. You know, I have a cousin who has an iPhone 4 that the screen is busted. It takes her two hours to receive a message. I'm like, I keep telling her. I mean, Radio Shack has had what, there's so many places now that have them. An iPhone 5S is $99, and they'll even give you money for your broken iPhone 4. So I just, you know, we've been ragging on her for months. We can't even text you. It's so old. <laughs> so it just baffles me that that's still sold in other countries. All right, so moving on, I'm going to give Peter his moment in the sun. Last year, the rumor was, well, not the, well, the rumor was, what happened was Apple took iOS, sorry, took OS 10 resources, once again shifted them over to um, iOS 7 in order to get it out the door in time. This has happened previously with Leopard and the original iOS. Peter, this year the rumor is Apple wants to get, um, I'm going to say this because this takes forever, OS 10, 10.10, .10, out the door, redesigned and done. In order to do that, they are taking iOS designers <laughs> and sending them over to work on OS 10. Yeah, as you point out, you know, this is not un un unknown for Apple to do in the past. Apple shifts engineering resources where they need to be at any given time. iOS 7 was a really big rollout for Apple. In some ways, it was iOS's transition from classic iOS to iOS 10, if you will. Um, so, you know, 7 was a big change for iOS, both in terms of the, the UI and also in terms of the under underlying, uh, uh, you know, meat of the operating system. Uh, that required engineering resources to be taken away from OS X. And the result was that Mavericks wasn't as dramatic an update as some people were expecting, although there were a lot of uh, core solid improvements, including some that were designed to make coexistence with iOS um, a little bit easier, um, you know, at least on the cloud side of things. Uh, so I don't think it's unreasonable to expect Apple to do the reverse this year. The, the rumors make absolute sense that Apple would divert engineering resources from iOS 8 uh, and put them on iOS 10. I mean, put them on OS 10, 10.10 .10 instead. Um, the the question is, what is the result going to be? Um, are we going to see another major? Um, under the hood rework of OS X, along with uh, the visual interface changes that we're already expecting and some of the other things that have been predicted. 
The thing for me, and we, this by no means is new. I mean, a lot of people are reporting it, but going back to last year's WWDC, we heard that this was in the plans. There was just no way for Apple to do iOS 7 and OS 10, a complete redesign at the same time. They just don't have enough designers. Witness them taking designers away from iOS 8 to work on OS 10, 10.10. But I don't know if it speaks to the length or the depth that this design is going to go. And I think it's also interesting because a lot of people don't appreciate design. They'll say that Apple wasted a year or you know, and wasted a year for developers by doing the iOS 7 redesign. And if Craig Federici gets up on stage and announces OS 10.10 and the biggest feature is the redesign, they might consider that nothing, like a coat of paint. But to a lot of designers, a lot of developers, and absolutely to Apple, design is how it works. It is the user experience. And very few things are as important or are as big a feature as the design. I mean, just go back to the OS X um, preview when Steve Jobs was, he spent forever playing with those little buttons, doing the genie effect, talking about the lickability of the design and the, you know, the candy-like appearance of the buttons and the UI elements. It is a big deal to Apple. It is a big deal to a lot of people because that is how humans interface with machines. But I don't know if it says anything. And let me ask you first, Ali. Does it say anything to you about the depth of this design that Apple has to move resources over to finish it? Sure. Um, the way I kind of look at it from an app perspective or with OS X or iOS, um, an app is no good to me if I can't use it efficiently, and that's where design comes in. I don't care how good an app is, if it's hard for me to use or I can't figure it out or you know, using it is frustrating, I'm probably going to look for another solution. So I think that that experience is what keeps people using OS X. Um, you know, my, my mom can pick it up and use it just like she can iOS, and if that changes, then that's a problem. So I think design is a huge part of that, and I think... I think that that would justify switching over resources, even if it is just a new design. Yeah, and you said this before, Peter, right? That the halo effect is just the potential halo effect is just so massive that it it suits Apple to have it easier for iOS users to understand what the Mac is. Yeah, absolutely. People wander into um, Apple retail stores and other places where Apple products are sold every day, um, who are already familiar with. Uh, with with iOS or are already familiar with the iPad, you know, the, the maybe they have an iPod or the iPhone itself, and they want a new computer experience because they're dissatisfied or because they've got antiquated equipment, whatever the whatever the reason is. Those people are buying Macs. How many of them? About half the people that that that, that buy new Macs are new to the platform. They're not getting here by themselves. They're getting here from that exposure to those other products. Uh, so it is incredibly important for Apple to have a a consistent user experience from one to the next. You know, some more paranoid OS X users have, have talked about the iOSification of OS X, but Apple is very cognizant that OS X is used very differently um, than, than, than iOS and, and is designed for a di very different machine than iOS is. Um, so it, it, it blurs those lines where it makes sense, but that is what Apple does that that very few other companies can, uh, can, 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 can compare to. Uh, Nick Costa in the chat room is asking, why not call it OS 11 if it's going to be that big an update? My understanding is that Apple changes version numbers almost basically when the platform changes. Like OS 10 was not just an update to OS 9. It was a fundamental change in the platform. It went to being a Unix machine, and I don't think we'll see... I don't even know if we'll see OS 11 or we'll just see whatever is next. If you go five years out or ten years out, it's hard to imagine that we'll be using... Just there's the Internet of Things as a confluence of mobility. Laptops are becoming more like tablets. Tablets like laptops. There will be a point where Apple... You know, maybe it's the HFS Plus, you know, biting them in the ass, you know, finally. But there will be a time, I think, when there's a substantial move forwards in these platforms. And I think that's the only time we'll see either the OS X or even the iOS name retired. Yeah, and I mean, you know, version numbers are not incremented, you know, according to decimal math either. You know, it's not like 10.10 um, uh, doesn't make any sense. It's a mouthful, which is why, you know, Apple brands stuff like Mountain Lion or Mavericks. You know, so we'll see what they come up with this time. Uh, Dave Wiskus is already calling it OS 10-point tenderloin. Very nice. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going for City of Compton myself. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I I think all of that is absolutely true, and I think Apple is very you know as much as Daniel Jalcut might not like it, I think OS 10.10, you know that's going to be the really it's not going to be a name that people see. I mean, you don't see 10.9 on Apple's website very much if at all anymore. You just see Mavericks. Ali, are you hoping for Long Beach, OS 10 Long Beach? What? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. That's where I live, but not yeah. in California. In no, Indiana. it's so confusing. Close to Michigan. We have another question. This one I'm going to give to you, Peter. Um, if Apple reveals the MacBook Air with Retina display, is there any idea what it would be priced? I mean, the MacBook Pro with Retina display was significant. Well, it was in, it was exp more expensive enough than the traditional MacBook Pro that that MacBook Pro still lingers to this day. I don't I don't think you can do Retina without a bump in price. Yeah, my my expectation would be that a MacBook Pro with Retina display would replace the the conventional MacBook Pro that is still part of the product line at 11.99. The MD101 model, which is a 13 uh, inch MacBook Pro with uh, internal uh, CD DVD drive and 500 gigabyte hard drive, that's the one that's going to go bye bye. That machine is two years old. You know, it's it is. Uh, it's living beyond its its usefulness now to Apple, so it makes sense that Apple would probably stick it right in that price point right there. And that may have even been one of the reasons why Apple dropped the price of the MacBook Air uh, with this most recent uh, update. Um, you know, the little bump in processor that we got last week uh, also dropped uh, the price $100. So that might be Apple just trying to give some wiggle room uh, for a Retina display MacBook Air in there someplace. Then again, I could just be reading tea leaves. That's what we do, Peter. <laughs> uh, you know, Apple only releases products between June and, and September. The rest of the time, we're doing anthropomancy. That's true. So uh, you did a great editorial, too, on what the price changed. We haven't talked about this. Um, last week, we had a, a, a special show, so we haven't even talked about this yet, and I just remembered that. But you had a great piece on, you know, what the price cut means um, whether it should change any of the buying patterns of people, whether you know if you're if you're thinking about buying a new MacBook, how it changes it. But also, and what I really liked is I bought the MacBook Air. I have a Retina MacBook Pro, and it sounds stupid and indulgent, but I bought a Retina MacBook, sorry, a MacBook Air for when I travel because 12 hours of battery life, I can shut down a coffee shop, and a Retina MacBook Pro won't. I, I don't think it would give me that. So I think that if I was still prioritizing battery life, I would still I would have nothing. The, the the new MacBook Airs that were just released would be very appealing to me. Yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, 12 hours is incredible, and you know, all, having a 15-inch MacBook uh, MacBook Pro with Retina display, I understand what you're talking about. You know, I, I get a fraction of that uh, with my machine, but then again, I have unlimited cosmic power, so I don't really <laughs> care that much. Um, uh, but you know, a, 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 an all-day you know a, a Retina display with an all-day battery would be a killer combination. You know, so would a pony that shoots, you know, rainbow sherbet out its butt. <laughs> Allie would say unicorn, but I think she'd agree with you. Yeah, I have a Haswell 13-inch, one of the newer MacBook Airs, and I forget to charge it, and yeah. it doesn't even matter. I just throw it on my desk when I get home, and, I mean, I use my iMac when I'm at home, and I'll go days without charging it and forget that it's there and throw it in my bag and be like, crap, and then I open it up, and, oh, I have 80% battery still. Okay, a whole other day on this. Well, but, I understand. I'm sorry, go on. I'm debating over a Retina MacBook Pro this time around, just because I, I missed the 15-inch screen on my MacBook Pro that I had prior to my Air, but I've done the same as Renee, and I'm, I'm debating keeping the Air for travel, just because it's so small, and it gets I don't bring a cord with me. If I'm just going for a weekend, I wouldn't even bring a cord. Well, 13-inch form factor a laptop is the most uh, popular laptop. You know, it, it, it is an incredibly popular laptop size, um, especially for Apple. And that's why Apple's got so much product right in that space. You know, the 13-inch MacBook Air, the 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina Display, and the conventional 13-inch uh, MacBook. So keeping it in that size or... Uh, approximately within that size makes a lot of sense. We've heard the rumor that it's going to be a 12-inch. I don't, you know, pretend to know whether or not it's going to be 12 or 13, uh, but I think it'll be something like that because that is just a, a very popular size to have, and it gives Apple the right trade-off of 
size and weight versus battery life, processor performance, and so on. Um, I understand that the Broadwell processor that uh, Intel has delayed until the third quarter of this year has 40% faster uh, graphics um, performance than Haswell. That could be an important clue as to what Apple's waiting for before they put these things into production. So yeah, and even the... Fall? Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, I'm Ali. sorry, Ali? You think it'll be fall? I think it'll be sometime in the second half of the year, yeah. Yeah, so even for MacBook Pros, Retina, you don't think they'll update those? They may. They may, and keep them with Haswell. You know, I guess that's possible, but it, I think it would probably make more sense to stick to an annual uh, upgrade uh, path, so we wouldn't see them until, uh, you know, October or November, just like we did not last year. The um, the 11, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but the 11 and the 13, those are rounded off, right? Like, So we don't know if the 12 is rounded off, how much actual difference there would be between them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised because last year Apple bumped the MacBook Airs at WWDC, but they've already bumped those. We have the, you know, the missing in action Mac Mini. We could still look forward to a Haswell update for. Mac Pros are probably too early for an update because they just got one. MacBook Airs, I mean, anytime, I, I, they still seem highly dependent on Intel's release schedule to me. So you look at when Intel's chips come out, and then you can pretty much tell when, when the Macs will get bumped. Oh, how I pine for Apple not to have to deal with Intel anymore. I look forward to that day. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, uh, so, of course, some, something will go missing, and that'll be the ability to, uh, to run Windows on your Mac. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I don't know how many people are running Windows on their Windows anymore, Peter. I know. <laughs> Seriously, right? Yeah. Um, all right, so a couple other quick things. I don't know if we talked about the public Apple C beta for 10.9.3. Uh, That's probably going to be out sooner than later. I think Apple last time released it sometime. The, the equivalent update for Mountain Lion sometime around WWDC. Um, you gave some very good advice, Peter, for you know normal people who only have one machine to stay the hell away from that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I understand why people would be interested in it, but it is beta software. You know, the important thing to do is uh, is to um, uh, avoid putting it on a machine that is your primary machine. If you if you're lucky enough to have a secondary machine that you can't that you don't count on, then by all means, uh, um, uh, put it on that system, but not one that you're going to need any kind of support for. Because if you walk into an Apple store, give Apple Care a call or whatever, um, they're not going to be able to help you because it's beta software. Better safe than sorry is my mantra. You know. Yeah, I agree. I'm not running it on anything. I know Marcus, our uh, our boss, is running it because he's running three enormous 4K monitors, and 10.9.3 is the only thing that supports that. But I don't have a NASA control room on my mantle, so I'm not. I'm staying away from it. Well, 10.9.3 isn't the only thing that supports it. 10.9.2 supports 4K monitors as well, but 10.9.3 supports 4K monitors way better than 10.9.2 does. Yeah. So 60 hertz uh, refresh rate. Right, exactly. So, you know, Marcus, keeper of, of uh, giant dis or hi very high-resolution displays, it's important for him. Not necessarily for the rest of us, though. All I don't think so there are too many of us that are driving 4K monitors yet. I can't. I have no way of knowing how you guys are getting light on your video right now. It might be 4K <laughs> displays. Uh, moving on, we've been putting up a series of articles about iOS 8. I'm trying to do one a day. I did my annual rant about lack of... Um, files.app and document picker on iOS. And this is something that, you know, I wanted for iOS 4 and I'm still sore about it. Uh, the basic idea, if you're new to this, and I'll put it in the show notes, is that there is no file system in iOS, and I'm fine with that. I don't think normal human beings should have to worry about file systems. My mom, my dad, they should not have to figure out what file hierarchy their file is in. But right now we're stuck in app jails. They have to remember what app their file is locked in. And God help them if they ever delete an app and then want a file they created with it because they have to go and reinstall that app and hope it hasn't been deleted. Uh, I think Apple, by trying to avoid the file system so assiduously, has created an equal problem with the app system. And all I'm asking for is for them to use something similar to what they did for photos. So you have photos.app, and you open that up, and all your photos are in it. You can have albums with those photos in. You can't have a hierarchy of albums, albums within albums, but you can have a layer of albums, sort of like you can have a layer of apps in folders on the home screen. And then Apple has Image Picker Controller, which any app can call up, and it shows you that hierarchy, that, that set of photos. 
you know, shows you your camera roll, your iCloud photos, your Instagram photos, whatever you happen to have in the camera app. And you can use that to open photos in any other photo app, save them back to the camera roll. It's not a file system, but it gives you a lot of capabilities. And I think it'd be awesome if Apple made a files.app that had everything that you have on your device and in iCloud's document, uh, documents in the cloud. And also, you could call it up in any app. Like, you could call up the PDF, open it up in any app, call up a text file, open it up in any app that handles text files, and so on. Save it back to that. It would solve a lot of inter-app communications needs. It would solve the problem of not having the app installed that you created it in. Uh, I think it's way better than if Apple goes ahead with a preview.app or a... Um, Rich, uh, text editor dot app for iOS that are only that that only purpose would be to open up the equivalent files in OS 10, and I'll get off my rant box now. But uh, I think that it enables so much stuff. It would let you send files over AirDrop for iOS. It would let you um, elegantly handle sharing in so many different ways. And Ali, darn it, I want it for iOS 8 again. The only problem I see with that, and I hope that. Apple would not do if they did do that is there's a lot of storage issues with iCloud and with the way that iOS saves files now. Um, we've talked about that with iMessage and with other apps that not only you save a picture from iMessage in your camera roll, instead of pulling from the same place, you now have two photos on your phone eating up storage. So I would hope that they would remedy those issues before bringing them to a new document picker or files.app because I think they'd be reluctant to give third-party developers access to a native app. I think that kind of solves it. Though. I think once you have the repository, all those apps could just pull the instance of the image or file from the repository. I wish they would do that with Photos app. I wish instead of replicating the photo to messages, they would just pull it from uh, Image Picker each time. And that way, you know, I, I guess maybe they're worried that people deleting it in iMessage would delete it in the in the in the camera roll as well. Um, so maybe there's a lot of yeah. So maybe there is a layer of complexity there. But I think it solves a lot of problems anyway. And maybe Apple should just give us unlimited storage in iCloud for the amount of size that we have device. Yeah. There, the amount of space that's available for people in iCloud is a little ridiculous. It, it needs to change. Yeah, if, if you get 120... offer me a terabyte, why can't Apple give me more than 5 gigs? It's excruciating. Although, you know, according to your review today of Google Sheets, Ali, giving people massive amounts of storage doesn't help if their app sucks. No, not at all. Um, I kind of opened that, and I thought I was missing something when I opened Google Sheets. Give me some background. So Google Sheets, it used to be Google Drive, but now they've got separate apps? Yeah, well, you've always been able to access, from my understanding, I don't really use Google Docs except what we do here at uh, Mobile Nations, but my understanding was the Google Drive app before could allow you to access all of those in one app. Now Google has went and split off into different apps, Google Sheets for spreadsheets, Google Docs for documents, and then Google, I think, Slides they're coming out with, but that's not available just yet. And I did a review of Google Sheets, and um, I don't really work with spreadsheets too often now, but I know enough about them from past jobs to know that anyone that even touches on formulas or forms or it's it's a useless app. It just you pretty much can enter text into cells and really nothing past that. Um, I don't get it. So a lot of the things that you would even want to use Google Docs for, like you know creating fillable forms, you can't do any of that. Um, I'm not sure why they came out with native apps that have less functionality than what other options have. I don't know. Kind of feels like a me too option. So, you know, Apple has iWork, and then Microsoft just released Office for iPad, and then it's like, hey, me too, here's, here's our app. I would have rather them waited and released something that made sense than something that was half-baked. I get, I don't know how much you've used them, Peter, but I've, I, I, like Ali said, at Mobile Nations, we live on Google Docs, and I think that's true for a lot of people. And the wisdom, maybe you, you're even the one who said this, but the wisdom when Microsoft released Office is that, yes, you have to pay for a 365 subscription, but if you were already locked into 365, it was great to be able to have it on the iPad. And I think people like us, whose company is all in on Google Apps, or if you personally, your school, whatever, is all in on Google Apps, it makes sense to have those on iOS. 
but Google's never been competitive, you know, much less with Office, with with iWork even in terms of functionality. Yeah, you know the the, um, uh, the 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 limits of of their ability kind of come through uh, when you start putting their their products on other platforms. Uh, I yeah, it, it all depends on which ecosystem you get pulled into. You know, I, you can make the same uh, you know comment about iCloud to a certain degree and the apps that Apple you know has. Um, that that not only Apple but also third-party uh, companies that depend on iCloud uh, for data synchronization. You know, so uh, every ecosystem is a world unto itself. Yeah, and everyone's got their own strong points and weak points. The question is, what do you want to fork money over to? Because one way or another, you are somebody is going to get paid here. You know, regardless of whether you're, you know, you're, you're paying for Office 365 or uh, you're forking over money to Apple for iTunes Match or for uh, larger amounts of iCloud storage uh, or, you know, whatever with Google, um, you're giving somebody money here or, if not, you are the product and yeah. it's giving your data, data that's, yeah. right, exactly, it's your data that's being used here, so... I, I would rather pay the devil I know than deal with the data mining I don't know. You pick yeah. your poison or you deal with fragmentation. So I can have files on Google for free, I can have photos on Flickr for free, but I'm not going to have one repository that I can keep everything in. Not everything in Google Plus, Allie. That's a great point. That's a great point, Allie. That sounds like an awesome idea. I'm going to do that tonight. <laughs> Uh, so a couple other quick things. I don't know what to do with this. Uh, I'm in Canada, which means I now have access to Rovio's um, um, Flappy Bird clone retry. I think it's called retry. Uh, I mean, I asked this question when we first saw this. Why? But it sounds like Rovio is looking to make more money, and Flappy Wings is the bank they're trying to hook the Brinks truck up for. To what? I missed this. Obviously. Did you see this, Peter? Yes, I did. Does it make you as sad as it makes me? Yeah, it, yeah, it makes it makes me it it makes me sad in the same way that seeing a million Temple Run clones made me sad. You know, it it, it it's yeah. I mean, you, you don't like to see these ideas beaten into the ground, even by big companies that think that they're bringing something to it. But whatever. Well, if you're American, you can't use it yet, so that's fine. You did a great piece, um, Peter, on. I forget the word you used for them. They were always like adventure games for me or narrative games. For oh me. yeah, text adventure games. So um, uh, back in the in the early days of computing, when I first started, it was like you know 19. Well, the first time I actually sat down in front of a PC was like 78. But by 81, I had my own. And the the first kind of game that I really got into was text adventure games. Games like Colossal Cave Adventure. Um, or uh, uh, just plain old adventure, it was sometimes called. Um, and uh, Infocom, Infocom back in the 80s made games based on uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. They had their own line called Zork, which was, you know, sort of a dungeon crawling adventure. Um, uh, really fun stuff to play. Um, that you would use text to interact with. So if you wanted to move north, you would type N. If you wanted to move east, you would type east. There was no graphics uh, involved with these. It was pure text. It was like a, a choose-your-own-adventure book yes. on the computer, only much more advanced and much more elaborate and much more branched. Um, they were. It was a wonderful time, but you know the interesting thing is that you can draw a, a parallel from that very old-fashioned, text-driven style of gaming straight to games like The Walking Dead or The Wolf Among Us from Telltale Games. You know they're graphic adventure games, but the core element of what you're doing is still, uh, you know, interacting with a narrative like that. It's just it, it's it, it's 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 been continuously evolving all this time. Yeah, I th I, there's so it's so interesting to me the game space. And you know, there's iOS like Nintendo brought all these casual gamers people because it was it was a um, it was a combined device. You know, you you just got gaming basically for free when you got an iPhone. It, it was also a great gaming device. So people who otherwise might not have picked up a Nintendo portable like a Game Boy or a PlayStation Portable, PSP or something, they could, all of a sudden, the same app store they went to to get the program they needed, they saw all these games that they wanted. Um, and the transition has been interesting to see, especially all these genres of 
of games, and I hope I hope there is a rich future for these because there is something to be said for a story well told. There really is. I mean, I think that that's incredibly important to any kind of gaming experience, you know, and that's why ultimately games like Flappy Bird are really mm -hmm. kind of an empty experience for a lot of people because it's nothing but Twitch. You know, it's mm -hmm. nothing but reacting to something that's happening on the screen, and that's okay for a certain se segment of players. That's okay for uh, a novelty, but you get bored of it after a while. Um, and having a deeper experience with, with a game often depends on some sort of narrative uh, experience. You can even say this about stuff like Candy Crush Saga. You know, Candy Crush has a certain narrative flow to it. There are episodes uh, of of things. There, there, you know, there's there's more content being added to it. It all adds up to a consistent narrative flow. Um, so that narration, that experience of 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 story in game, um, is is very key, I think, to what makes games sticky and appealing to people and make them come back to them over and over again. I think that's very true. Ali, is that what brings you, brings you back to Candy Crush? I am not a Candy Crushaholic. What? No, my girlfriend is, and she has lost hours of her life. I have, have had dreams about candies crushing in my head over and over from hearing that stupid game. But, um, yeah, I have some... I, I am more of a fan of games like Tiny Wings. Again, it has a storyline. It has different objectives, things that you have to follow. Um, I think that I get hooked on games like that that the developers support. So I've seen some games where it is just what it is. I think part of the reason games like Candy Crush do so well is they're constantly adding to them too. So it adds new challenges, and I think that's important. Um, but yeah, I, I do agree with that. And you have to have some type of narrative there to have you know to grasp people's interest. If only they made a Glee game. <laughs> So the last thing I want to touch on is, again, because we, we did a special episode last week, we didn't talk about comicsology at all, and so much has been said about it that I don't want to retread all of it, and I've been working on an editorial I can't finish for a week on it. Uh, but a couple things I wanted to bring out, and I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts. So the crux of it is this. Comixology was the highest grossing non-game app in the App Store. They sold comic books from Marvel, DC, and others. They also white-labeled the Marvel app, the DC app, uh, they were acquired by Amazon. A few weeks later, they put out a new app that removed the in-app purchasing system so you could no longer buy comics within the app. You have to go to their website now, similar to how Amazon does the Kindle app in order to buy. Now, it's hard for me to tell. Everyone assumed Amazon did this. I don't know if Comixology was always planning this because when you do it outside the App Store, you don't have to pay Apple 30%. Apple takes 30% of anything that's paid. Free stuff stays free, no cut for Apple. If, if you're charging money, though, Apple gets a cut. For apps, that's you know, Apple does a lot of stuff. They do all of the hosting, the provisioning, the fulfillment, all that kind of stuff. For in-app purchases, they only handle the transaction. The developer has to de deliver all the content. So some people think 30% is too steep for that. Obviously, Amazon does. There's also limits to the amount of items that in-app purchasing can handle. I forget the number, 3,500, 1,000 or something. It's a lot, but it's not enough for some things like Amazon's entire catalog, maybe even Comixology's entire catalog. Uh, but people got really, really angry, and they blamed Amazon for ruining Comixology. They blamed Comixology for destroying the user experience, and they blamed Apple for being greedy. But my, the crux of my opinion on this is that it's a really hard problem to solve because um, Amazon, for their part, has to deal with vast amount of consumable digital items. And it really is only digital. If you sell real-world items, you can do whatever you want. Apple doesn't care. It's only digital items they really care about. Um, Comixology is a middleman, in a, and Apple is already a middleman, and there's only so much money. If Comixology is only making 30% on a comic, it, it's tough to give Apple 30%. And Apple is stuck because if they charge anything less than 30%, people will just go outside the App Store. If Apple charges 30% for stuff you do in the App Store, but you know uh, subscriptions or in-app purchases are free, Almost every app that can will switch to being a free app with subscriptions or in-app purchases. And the entire economy will move outside of Apple. You'll download either something like Office where you have to log in to use it, or you'll download something that's empty and you have to pay to fill it up with levels or books or anything else. 
Um, and that's the reason why I think this is still lingering year after year. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, Peter, but my sense is that if there were easy answers, we would have them. And right now, you can blame each of those people, but they're all just trying to do what's in the best interest of their business. Yeah, you got to look out for number one. There's no way around it. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the Comicsology did what they, or I shouldn't say Com Comicsology, Amazon did what they felt that they needed to with with uh, with Comicsology to make it make sense for them. Uh, the problem here is ultimately the user experience, and the user experience has been harmed by what they've done. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens from here on out uh, in, in terms of uh, how broadly this gets used and also how much Amazon can sort of work it into their seamless customer experience. We were talking about ecosystems before um, and you know how you know you, you sort of have to you know you pay your money and you take your chances you know whether it's Office 365 or iCloud or whatever. The same kind of goes for Amazon. A lot of people are very comfortable with digital transactions from Amazon. Uh, happens very seamlessly you know for Kindle. They've got the the uh, the ability to move this stuff. So, um, I'm, I, I, if anything, I hope that it improves the the Comixology experience, but I don't think it's going to in iOS specifically. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, Ali, you used to run your own business. I mean, you pay rent to your landlord. You pay you pay the people who supply you with your components. It's it's tough math. It is, and you have to, like Peter said, absolutely, you have to look out for number one. And somewhere in that equation, someone realized that going outside of the App Store for purchases is in their best interest, whether that's Amazon or Comixology or whoever. Um, that's more cost-effective for them. And I guess if they lose, if their sales plummet because they've removed the ease of use that is in-app purchase, they'll have to reassess their decisions. Yeah. Or maybe there's so much money that they, I don't know. I can't solve these problems. If I could, I'd be running the App Store. Um, Peter, the, the chat room loves your new glasses. Thank you, chat room. I love them too. Um, James is asking, do you use AirPlay speakers? Peter has written an entire piece on, I think, his five favorite AirPlay speakers, so I will link to that in the chat in the uh, show notes yeah um, as a matter of fact uh, reviewer or people who are commenting on it mm -hmm. have asked for a roundup of cheap airplay speakers so I think that's going to be my next thing nice and the last question uh, also from James what cases if any are you using and I'll just go around the room Ali what do you use nothing Peter I have a PDP case uh, for my iPhone that has the uncanny X-Men on them I am so jealous. <laughs> I am also like Ali naked as the day my iPhone was born. Uh, but I do test a lot of different cases, so it's just it's, when I when I need to, I use them. I feel like this would be the appropriate time for an. I don't often use a case, but when I do, I get it from the from the iMore store. Mm -hmm. Nice Mother's Day sale, twenty percent off. Take advantage of it, whether you're a mother or not. Store.imore.com. How's that? There we go. All right. Thank you so much. Allie, can you tell us where people can find you on the interwebs? Oh, I am at iMuggle on all of the things, Twitter, uh, Google+. I'm just Allie Kazmuha, and I'm pretty sure that's it. And every day at iMore.com. iMore.com slash tips for all your awesome how-tos. Peter, whereabouts are you? I am at Flarg on Twitter, uh, F-L-A-R-G-H, and, of course, uh, all over iMore. Awesome. And you can find me at Rene Ritchie on all the social things. You can find me at iMore and Mobile Nations. You can find this show. Usually we're doing it a day early because I'm traveling this week, but you can usually find us Thursday afternoons, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, currently 9 p.m. British summertime. Being here live is the absolute best way to enjoy the show because you can ask questions the kind our chat room and our hangout asked us today and get answers to the things you want to know about. If you can't join us live, you can also get the show on demand. We're available on YouTube for the video or on iTunes or RSS for the audio mm -hmm. or the video. You can find the links to subscribe right below us in the post. If you have any questions on the show after we finish doing it, please leave a comment. Please send an email to podcast.imore.com or just you know yell at us on Twitter or the social network of your choice. Peter, Ali, thank you so much. It's been a terrific show. I enjoyed myself thoroughly. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having us. And the quarterback is toast. <laughs>